<clears throat> All right. I think we are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another game, Unity Game Developer Discussion Podcast. Got to workshop that name. It's, it sounds kind of like... Just add a few more words. I think you're missing about five or Unity six. Unity 3D Discussion with Game Developers. <laughs> Software, C-sharp principles, something, something, something. Something, yeah. something, something. Anyway, in this uh, in this live stream, we're going to do a discussion about <laughs> Unity game development. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat at any time, and uh, Jason and I will get to them. Uh, before we dive into that, though, a little bit of bookkeeping, I suppose. Uh, next week, uh, I won't I won't be live streaming, but there will be a live stream on this channel, um, and that will be hosted by Jason. So Jason's going to how did you describe it exactly? It was like a. Uh, did I? Um, you had a good. You had a good description. I, yeah. So basically, what I was saying is, so a, a, a sort of a discussion doesn't make much sense when you're the only person there. True. Make a lot of sense just talking to myself, uh, at least not on camera. So instead, one thing I thought would be interesting topic to cover is there was a couple of things I'd like to go over. Uh, most notably, how to approach problem solving hmm. as a developer. So I thought we would go over. Um, fields and references for the common questions like how should I do fields in Unity? Should I use serialized fields? Should it be public? Should it be private? Should I use properties? Um, how do I reference other objects and that kind of thing? And rather than just go to direct answers, uh, I thought we could do a step through of sort of problem solving and what each different approach gives us in, in terms of benefits and costs. So yeah, so basically cool. a step through and an explanation of approaching the problem of um, how I reference other objects and scripts. So Very that cool. should be the topic. I look forward to it. I will be tuning in. <laughs> I'm actually, <laughs> I'll be traveling for work next week. That's why I won't be at the stream, but uh, I will definitely tune into the chat. So you don't want to miss it. Um, be sure to come and have questions ready for Jason as he goes and does his tutorial, his as live video tutorial, I guess you could call it. You know, it's going to be a, a pretty cool interactive thing, I think. So excited for that. But then the following week, I will be back. Um, and then Jason and I will jump into the second part of reviewing Sean's code. For those of you who are with us last week, we took a look at um, Sean's Oregon Trail uh, port. Switch to that on the screen. This is what we were working on. Uh, Jason and I were taking a look at it this week, and it started evolving into something. We started workshopping, maybe doing a video. But I think realistically, we could probably cover with you guys in a full stream of this code review uh, kind of all the things that we want to cover there. And kind of like uh, what Jason will be doing next week, um, this will be sort of like a, a like a live video tutorial, if you will. Um, it, it'll be a really good opportunity to really dive deep on maybe some topics I couldn't really cover in a video because they're, you know, maybe more suited for a live stream and live discussion. So um, that's kind of what we got going on. Other than that, I just posted the highlights from last week's live stream. So if you haven't caught them already, please go check those out. Uh, I think you'll enjoy them. And if you have caught them, make sure that you also leave a like on them because it really helps uh, bring people to the stream. And uh, then we get we have better discussions because we have more people asking questions. So um, other than that, make sure you hit that smash that like button. And uh, <laughs> I guess we can jump into uh, some discussion here. I don't see any questions in the chat just yet. Feel free to drop them in. If you want to do a code review, want us to have your code reviewed, be sure to go to infallibleco.com uh, slash code dash review, and we will uh, we will try to review it soon. Hey, there's Sean. Yeah, just just to just to mention on the on the Sean's code thing. So just to uh, so yeah, we were basically having a look at it, and we started going through a sort of more advanced review, and we were kind of like, how would we how would we take this from here's some small steps you can do to change it to like a full on refactoring of, of various things and extracting out features. And we kind of thought we were kind of getting into it to the point. There's a lot of stuff here that we could do and we could cover a lot of topics. And, and you've seen in previous videos that we ended up spending like 40 minutes just talking about like five lines of code and getting really into it. So we thought this doesn't really lend itself well to, to the doing it live right now on stuff because you actually want to go and give it some thought and, and not just look at how we're going to approach splitting it up, but how we're going to approach explaining how we're splitting it up because something that's very hard to do is um it's, a, it's called the curse of knowledge right it's when you've been doing something long enough it's very hard to explain what you're doing mm. um you kind of forget what it's like at different levels of, of education so um it's kind of like the whole classic to try to explain to somebody how you ride a bike like you know how to ride a bike but you can't really explain it easily to somebody who, who can't do it um 
So we decided rather than just jumping in and trying to real time do it, do a refactoring on it because it wouldn't be very informative. It may sound like it would be, but it, trust me, I've done that before. <laughs> and if you just record somebody refactoring code, it, there's just it's very hard to follow what they're doing because there's people's individual mindsets are different when they're kind of approaching problem solving. Yeah. So we have to structure it in a way that makes sense as an educational piece of material. So um, we've decided there's enough meat on the bones of that project to go in and actually do a full compare and contrast versus the way it is now to, to the way uh, we might approach sort of a, a full-on refactored, refactored version and, you know, show them side by side and discuss it and do that kind of thing. So we're not going to cover it. Long story short, we're not going to cover it in this particular um, Q&A developer discussion thing, <laughs> but we will uh, We will for next at some stage in the future. We have we have plans. We have plans. So I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, and it's I like that, the curse of knowledge. Um it's definitely something that I'm I'm struggling with from a development standpoint right now because this is more of like a, I guess a development process sort of discussion. But um, currently at my day job, uh, we're really trying to to get the team on board with Scrum. You know, doing sprints. If you're not familiar with Scrum, it's a methodology of development, um, and that's you know working in um, uh, time box cycles called sprints. Um, doing things like having discussions about creating tickets, design discussions. Uh, something called a story time, a retrospective. If you know about Scrum, especially the corporatized version, all those words you'll have heard before. Um, but it really is a curse of knowledge for me because I am so familiar with the process that sometimes, you know, when I'm explaining it to a junior developer or a developer who has just always kind of been, uh, who's always just kind of shot from the hit. We call it like the Wild West is what we call the current situation at the, at the development shop I'm at. Um, it can feel like, heavy, heavy process. Like, why am I doing this? I don't understand what the benefit is. Um, and I have that curse of knowledge, right? Like I've seen it in action and, uh, you know, I've seen it implemented in a lightweight way that is very effective, but just trying to, just trying to convey that it's very hard to do, um, without actually showing it. So, yeah, I know we've talked about, uh, scrum in the past and how it's a little corporatized, but I I'm for it. <laughs> I'm not sponsored by anyone to say that. Who who would you be sponsored by for Scrum? I mean, yeah, Scrum right. is a, it's a conceptual methodology. I don't think there's a single shop anymore. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. Speaking of which, there's a great course. If you download it right now, you get it for 10%. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It'd be someone with a course on Pluralsight or something. Yeah. <laughs> Although I am a, I am a Pluralsight and Udemy affiliate now, so I, I probably should find a nice uh, Pluralsight course Perfect. to show. <laughs> well, until, the... until we finally get around to making our own that we can chill at some point down the line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, um, exactly. there's some questions now right so let's hey, jump into one that. of them uh david ladd asks uh, a question on particle effects i seem to struggle with magic damaging enemies is there a way that a particle effect is a trigger to damage enemies right hmm. technically yes so you can actually there's just a simple checkbox you can mark particles as being collidable and actually have collidable particles uh, a good example of this would be if you had uh, sparks or blood that when they drip would hit a surface and then add more sparks or, or blood on collision. That's doable, but I highly, highly kind of advise against using something as complicated as um, particle-based, individual particle collisions to do damaging enemies. Hmm. Um, because once you start doing a lot of this stuff, you start to realize you can cheat a lot more than you think you can. For example, if you throw a fireball that has a nice sparkling background to the whole thing when it arcs, that can be something as simple as uh, a sphere collider on an object which happens to have a spawning particle system inside of it because realistically having one-to-one -one accuracy to each particle hitting is just not worth the effort not worth the cost hmm. um so if the technical answer to your question is yes there is a way to have particles literally damage the enemy uh the more kind of practical answer to that question is think of them as two separate things think of an invisible um colliding sphere or circle that you're throwing through the air that will hit the enemy and cause damage and then design a particle system in and around that shape that will um, look good, similar to the, the shape of the collider. So try to treat them as two separate things that don't try to make the particles cause damage. Likewise, if you want to have a magical spray of some kind, don't, don't rely on the spray to cause the damage. Use a raycast to do the physical damage or use a giant sphere collider or, or giant box collider stretched out to do the actual spray and then use the particles simply as a visual representation. It's far more efficient if you don't actually rely on the particles being the colliders. Yeah, and I feel like it's more flexible too because you never know how you're going to change like the effect if it's going to go from mm. some sparkling fireball to, you know, maybe it's 
a giant floating star. Well, that's a weird suggestion, but you know, you never know. <laughs> um, and I, you know, you make a good point too about you really should separate your, you know, your visual representation from the actual logic. Uh, and that's where you have your collider comes through and you can, then you can layer any visual representation you want, even if maybe you won't even use colliders anymore. Maybe you have some other method that, uh, that you could use. Um, I'm not sure what that would be. <laughs> but... Again, like an example I made before is that out of curiosity at one stage, I started making a bullet, a kind of a gun bullet system mm. that was kind of reminiscent of Tracer's pistol. I kind of liked the pattern of little, you know, uh, full auto, empty clip, reload, full auto, empty clip. I liked that sort of rapid pacing fire to it. So what I did, I built the system where there was like a, a fire event at some point that got fired. And I built all of the logic for the rapid firing, for the reloading, for the waiting. All of that stuff is one big set of stuff. And then something got fired at the end. And in my first iteration, I was using um, bullets that were spheres. And it was just a sphere collider. Um, and I was spawning lots of them. So the bullets was actually firing like sprayed spheres. And then I said, you know what, let's try that with uh, Raycast. So I just literally swapped out one thing, the strategy that I was using for the physical fire portion, and swapped it out for Raycast, and it drastically changed the functionality, made the bullets have the, the full sort of instant reaction for shooting, and it worked um, better for the task I had in mind. So I guess the point of that little story is the idea that I wrote the logic to say, make gun that reloads, fires its full lot of bullets using this rate of fire, using this spread under these angles, and do the reload, and just keep doing all of that. But I never once had to decide at that stage whether I'm spawning objects or firing Raycast. Hmm. And likewise, with your magic spells and stuff, you can say, I press button, hit ping, do damage, and you can kind of speak in these abstract vague terms and then decide later the thing that spawned is a physical object which may have a particle system or maybe a sprite renderer or maybe a physical mesh that I'm throwing across the map. And it shouldn't really affect your logic from the visual perspective from how the, the renderer looks versus the mechanics of the features you're doing you know yeah so that separation of concerns really really helps mm -hmm. defining your boundaries um looks like we got another question here um i'm a web developer learning game development for three years by myself uh i've uh, did many personal projects but feel like it's not enough can you give me advice well um i guess it's just a matter of what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, what what are you not feeling like it's enough? Uh, these these personal projects have you put them out on the store like a, some sort of a store? I'm, I'm I was assuming that they were like mobile apps, um, but have you released them? Is there some sort of large project or dream game that you want to to sort of work up to? Um, you know, it, everyone's journey in life, but also everyone's game development journey, you know, can be different. And I think, uh, you know, having goals in place uh, can really help guide where you go and how you advanced uh, and you advance. I mean, recently I put out that video about uh, MMOs. God, it's like every every stream I got to bring up that word. <laughs> is, is an MMO worth your trouble? And one of the key points, uh, takeaways was, sure, everyone's got that, you know, dream game idea. Uh, maybe it's a, an MMO, but typically it's some large vision that you have for a game. Um, but of course, you're going to have to have some milestones along the way. And, uh, you know, so the best thing I could say is if you're feeling like you're stalled in your development, um, try to set yourself some reasonable goals and try to achieve them. Try to do things that fit your vision. Like, for instance, you know, God forbid, let's say you're actually your dream is to make an MMO then, and you've never explored multiplayer games. Maybe you should try to make a small multiplayer uh, like a small personal project that's like a, a, a implementation of a multiplayer game. Um, so yeah, that'd be my advice there. I mean, if you've been working in game development for a while, personally, as a side hustle or a hobby, you know, set yourself some reasonable goals and try to try to see if those goals produce some sort of outcome or, or, or some sort of growth that you're looking for. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the advice to improve. But I guess looking at the question, I think the more to the heart of it, more so than like what what the next steps would be, is the line that really sticks out to me is it uh, doesn't feel like enough and uh, it never will feel like enough. Hmm, hmm. Classic imposter syndrome. Everybody has point. it. Like, no matter how long you've been doing it for, no matter how many projects you do, um, everyone always feels like that other guy must know more than I do, must hmm. have done more projects than me. Uh, I had a really fun conversation with a guy um, a couple of weeks back where 
he said to me that he was intimidated by the amount of experience I had on a particular project. And I laughed and I said, you know, I'm intimidated by the amount of knowledge you have on the project <laughs> because I genuinely, we were talking and it's like, I was pointing out stuff that he'd done, which I was impressed by that I didn't know how to do. He was saying, no, no, but you can do this stuff and I don't know how to do that. And it just, it's just an infinite cycle of people always assuming um, that the other person knows far more than they do. And it's very funny because it's, everything in life is like this, right? Like if you know how to do something, it's very easy. It's like, I know how to do it. So of course it's easy. But um, until you know how to do something, you can assume infinite complexity and how difficult the task is, right? But no matter what it is you're doing. So we're all programmers. And if you talk to anybody who's not a programmer, they're going to say, that's, that's impossible. I wouldn't even know how to do that. But you could realistically talk someone through, you know, control flow and if statements and while loops. And then, then they're going to kind of go, yeah, that makes sense. That's logically consistent. But to them, it's insurmountably large as a concept. And so you'll never feel like you've done enough projects or know enough stuff. <laughs> um, the question becomes, when, is, when do you let that stop bothering you? When, when do you decide, regardless of how much I know, how about I just do the thing I want to do? Mm -hmm. so I would say just pick whatever it is, figure out what your goal is, and aim towards it. And it's better to be 10% towards your goal than to sort of sit there in the sidelines afraid you're not good enough to do it, you know? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think that's, you know, a sentiment that I used to feel whenever I'd go on to like the Unity subreddit and you see like every day people are posting GIFs of their projects and, you know, typically they're just, you know, vertical slices and of nothing that's really fleshed out. But even then you look at it and it's like, wow, what I haven't done anything, you know, but realistically, any one of those GIFs you could probably cook up in, a, in, a, in an afternoon um, because most of them don't really have a whole lot of functionality behind them other than the thing that they're showing so yeah that imposter syndrome you know it's very common and definitely something that to this day i even i feel i mean everyone feels it and something that kind of leans into the next question quite nicely mm -hmm. is a lot of people look at a project and they sort of um they don't realize that that's a lot of jobs mm. and i use this mm. as a negative when i was talking about mmos previously I was saying you may think you understand the full depth and breadth of a project but you really don't like there's a lot more to learn to take a game as simple as Snake and you could spend, if you wanted to, 20 years perfecting everything from user experience to level design to game flow to managing user expectations, all sorts of different things. You could just audio engineering to all sorts of stuff. You could just decide to infinite, because each one of those things is potentially a craft that could last forever. And usually <laughs> games aren't made by one person. They're made by a bunch of people. And even when a game is made by one person, that's usually technically a cheat. Because if you're saying this game was made by this solo developer, yeah, but they did hire an artist or they did hire a concept artist or they did, you know, farm out the audio or buy assets. That's not a negative. That's mm. actually a positive, you know, we don't, don't try to carry everything on your shoulders. And so yeah. if you look at projects and go, well, I've never completed a full project by yourself. So yeah, but you've written enough stuff. That you've done one of the jobs. You could easily have taken the code you've written, stuff you've done, and that would be enough for a project. It's just, you may not have, comfort in every single level of every aspect of a game so i wouldn't worry too much i would say if you're worried about never completing a project just find somebody who will fill the other side that you need find an artist who's like i've never finished a project but i don't know how to program i will never make a project and then <laughs> say well i can I, i'll never finish a project i can't do art but i can program oh no and the two of you will realize hang on a second if we both work together <laughs> you can solve a problem <laughs> so that that's that happens more often than you think it does um so yeah just Find people to work with if you're if you're too worried about not finishing a project yourself. You know? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, you made a good point. You can work peop with people implicitly by buying their assets. That's you're technically working. Pretty with Pretty much what it is. Yeah, like, <laughs> like well, oftentimes I'll go to the asset store and like literally, um, there's a sense of pride a lot of programmers have, where they'll say, "No, no, I could make the system myself." I said, "Yeah, there's many, many assets I own that I could make myself, or I can estimate how much would I pay myself as an hourly rate to do this job." How many hours is it going to take me between writing the code, doing the tests, verifying it works and all this kind of stuff. Or I can spend $20 on the asset store and basically <laughs> pay a massively subsidized rate that to have one guy work for me, so to speak, for hundreds of hours or something that would take me well, that same length of time roughly for $20 because it's, it's, it comes down to the fact that they've done it as an asset to sell in bulk. So you're getting a, a subsidized rate for whatever it is they, they work on. So working on using assets and kit bashing stuff together is a skill in and of itself, you know, like yeah. it's well worth 
accepting that you don't need to write every line of code in your own project. Yeah. Uh, I see another question here. I'm looking for uh, my first game dev job right now, but I'm struggling between whether to learn more about clean code, refactoring code, or developing more games, maybe games for mobile, etc. Okay, mm. that's a yeah. <laughs> As uh, Sparrowhawk says, that's the ten million dollar question. <laughs> Where should you focus your your resources? Uh, well, I mean, that's it. There, I don't feel like there's any particularly wrong answer. Um, you should definitely be doing something. Don't get stuck in analysis paralysis where you, you're not sure what you should do. Um, and then you just don't do anything. I'm guilty as charged. I do that a lot, <laughs> especially when, uh, when planning for something, a project. Um, I mean, I guess if you could identify a weak point you have, but as far as trying to get a game dev job, um, you know, you don't, you don't really have to have everything perfected to get the job. You know, you certainly could get a job and continue to hone things like you could continue to learn about clean code and how to refactor um, on the job. So just because you get a job doesn't mean the learning stops. And uh, if you've done a reasonable amount of work and you feel confident and, you know, game development shop hires you, then yeah, you should be fine. And you should just be okay to continue developing those skills. Well, I think again, Sparrow brings up a good point with that on two sides, which is one, um, you're going to learn how to do that stuff as you go anyway. Like, mm -hmm. I know the whole point of us doing these kinds of videos to talk about uh, practices and things that are clean code, et cetera, that will kind of help you as you go. Um, but as somebody who did spend literally years learning clean code and architecture as an isolated concept and then applied it to stuff, I don't actually recommend that route. I don't think it's probably a wise thing. To just say, I'm going to go and spend a year or two dedicating myself to learning clean architecture. I think the time I did that was far more wasted than the time I was working on real projects, hit mm. real problems, and then learned how to write cleaner code as a result of doing that. So I would say uh, the truth is, whatever your first few projects are, they're going to suck. They always do. And they're <laughs> going to have bad things. You're going to hit problems. So rather than learning how to write clean code and rather than trying to angle towards getting a job, th the fact is you're better off building things of mm -hmm. some nature, the things that you can do tweets with, things that you can put on the Unity 3D subreddit, things that you put yourself out there so people can get a sense of what your portfolio is. Mm -hmm. And if you can demonstrate work that you can do, and then in your free time between that, learn how to get better and learn how to make better code and make life easier for yourself as you go, um, somebody will pick up on that. Or be proactive and do the opposite, which is go and find people who are doing that on Unity 3 other places. In the public. So when it comes to looking for your first game dev job, you're not going to get it by knocking on doors or going to companies. You're going to get it by meeting people and working with people and finding the right contact. So just make stuff, make stuff, go to places where people talk about stuff they've made, you know, meet people, talk to people, work on things and just don't worry. Don't like the, the whole thing is you can't just drive to your destination. It's not, it's weird. It's hard to describe when you're talking about a job like game development. There's not like, there's not like a critical path. You can't just say, if you do these 10 steps, you will end up arriving at this place, which is called a game dev job. It doesn't really work that way, or at least not by anyone I've ever met. It is more a case of at some time you'll meet the right person under the right circumstance and do the right game jam or, you know, yeah. write the right comment in the right Discord channel or something. So I wouldn't stress out by actively trying to drive in the right direction. I would simply have fun making things that are very visible mm -hmm. and just be smart about putting your content out there so people will find you and want to work with you and reach out to people that you'd want to work with and just keep rolling the dice until something hits, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I see, um, you know, jury here in the comments says doing a game for my portfolio thoughts about releasing it thought about releasing it would look good. So it's a polished game slice, not a lot of content, which, which store would be good or better to make a, a repo public meaning he's just trying to figure out how to share this thing that he's created, whether or not he should put it up on a store or make his uh, repository public so people can see Both. it. Yeah, yeah. Put it in the store, do a GitHub repo, move on to the next project. Yeah, more content, just keep going. There's yeah. no like, Either, either you're angling to make money out of it or you're angling to use it as a as a putting stuff out there. I would focus on the putting stuff out there and not on the, the making money that early. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, and you definitely can get your name out there. You know, it's one of those things too. You know, game development is very visual. So even if you are a developer, um, you can come up with something reasonably polished and pretty that, you know, kind of exemplifies your pro your your abilities as a coder and as a game developer all around. Um, and then you just throw it into a GIF, drop it on Twitter, drop it in Reddit. And yeah, Jason touched on something really important. Do it a lot. You know, I can say as a YouTuber, 
I have to put out a video every week, you know, because I have to continuously put out content. And that's the same thing with game development. You need to be, uh, you need to demonstrate that you can uh, work consistently as well as, you know, produce quality stuff. So yeah, I think that will eventually lead to you being a part of communities, whether it be the subreddit or whether it be some discord server. And uh, that's just going to lead to you uh, being positioned to, uh, to get a job. It's like my favorite quote is, uh, luck is when opportunity meets um, preparation, you know, and by making games all the time, uh, making small projects that, you know, teach you, uh, you are preparing yourself for that opportunity um, when someone comes along and, and is looking for someone like you to add to their team. So, see, we got a uh, $5 super chat from in and out Thank you. Thank you. Um, he asks, is it true that an instantiated struct is not always allocated on the stack instead of the heap? It's a very, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Do you know, do you know the answer to that, Jason? Um, I do admit general it. General rule is, is if it's, if it's entirely made up out of um, value types, mm -hmm. it will always be um, on the stack. Unless there is either, for example, because you can technically make a struct which has a game object reference, which mm. would then, by nature of its design, have a reference in it that requires it <laughs> being allocated onto. Um, a much more practical answer to that question, though, because that, that I wouldn't worry too much. I would say the one thing to, to the, the thing that you're more in danger of is when you pass a struct around your application, you have a method where the method signature takes in an interfaced version or a base class version. So if it has, for example, object as a space class rather than the struct type itself, it will have to cast that and subsequently box that. And likewise with an interface. If you use an interface like, um, like the one you should, for example, like comparable or um, the I equality operator stuff so that you can have correct struct uh, equality, which by the way, look into that. You really want to correct struct equality when you're doing custom structs. Um, you, if you have a I comparable interface or something that you're using, it will have to cast to that, and that will cause your boxing, and that's where your allocation will change from stack to heap. So, I guess the tip there, if you want to avoid that problem, whenever you have a function call which takes in a version of a struct object, which can be cast to something, uh, make a second overload of that function which takes the explicit type as well. Okay, so you have a struct called dog. You might have an I animal method where it's like, you know, animal eat. If you just have an I animal function, it will always cast that struct dog into animal before it calls the function, and that will cause your uh, your allocation. If you have a function which takes in a dog, it will then not allocate, or because it will use the struct as is rather than casting hmm. first. Um, that gets into situations like you're losing. Um, you're losing your abstraction because you kind of have to. That's the whole point. The whole point of using your um, structs, is you have the, the better memory management for that. But the trade-off, of course, is that you're going to have a harder time being um, kind of abstract and vague with your interfaces. So structs use explicit types. That's kind of the general rule. If you do that, you won't have to worry about it. Sounds right to me. <laughs> um, cool. I see another question here before I get to it. Um, if you guys don't mind smashing that like button, we greatly appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to do like a quick 30 second rundown because we've kind of skipped a few questions that I, I think are like one liners. So I'll do a Yeah, quick yeah, for sure. Um, so one, one comment was uh, Can you get in trouble with Unity by having stuff on public GitHub repo and on the asset store? No, plenty of assets do it. A hmm. good example of this is in control. You can get an old version of it on the GitHub store or you can get the more up to date version on. The asset store and it's considered more of a patreon almost thing where you're saying if you'd like to support a developer you can get the version on the uh, asset store but you could also just grab it from, from the github repo and they're fine with that that's more of a personal preference thing rather than an actual what problem a, what about um what if i download like a paid 3d model and i drop it into a public repo i would think that that wouldn't be okay. oh yeah yeah you, if, if you do have a public repo then you can't use any assets that's not your own obviously yeah. Uh, this is mostly just for code stuff. Coding, yeah, coding yeah. assets. Yeah, definitely. If they like, I know Zenjek is on GitHub, you know, so you can get that too. Um, but yeah, uh, models and things like that, and audio and graphics, you definitely don't want to have those in a public repo. Pretty much, literally, if you didn't make it, don't include it. Um, have I used the incremental garbage collector yet? No. Um, 
it looks cool. I just haven't had the need for it. I haven't yet. As I discussed in a previous video, my most of my work is kind of uh, not massively. I don't have to, to scrape for memory management to that degree anymore as much as I used to. Um, there was another one. I just missed it. There. I wanted to get to Patrick's question. It's kind of a meta question, but I think it could be valuable. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Patrick asks, he, he says he's thinking about doing some coding series tutorials on YouTube. Um, you know, I think that's valuable. Uh, we were just speaking about how um, how can you share your work. And one of those, a way to do that is through YouTube. And whether that be like a dev vlog or a tutorial, um, I would suggest if you're going to do a tutorial that's supposed to be educational content, or and what is it edu edutainment edutainment yuck yeah <laughs> it's kind of what I do right <laughs> um, I highly suggest it's the name though the yeah, name I know I hate it too <laughs> I highly suggest uh, scripting it out um, and doing your research uh, because you just don't want to I mean this come on this should be obvious you don't want to spread misinformation also uh, when it comes to tutorials I guess if it's you're gonna do a coding series um, I would think through um, you know, trying trying to get a little depth. I think a, a topic like coding and programming um, requires a little bit of depth that I think is lacking sometimes on on YouTube. Uh, you get a lot of surface level stuff. Uh, yeah, and, like and on that note, just just please to anybody out there who wants to make video content. I know this may sound silly, but do your homework. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, so I like to consider. I know a lot of the topics I talk about because I do them on a daily basis and have done for. 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. But even still, when I write a blog post or when I go and talk about a topic, Q and A is a bit tougher because it's a bit off the cuff. But whenever I do anything that I'm kind of committing in terms of like a video or Q and A, or I actually make a lot of tutorial content kind of privately for clients and stuff as opposed to public stuff, I will go and Google it first. I will double check and make sure I know what I'm talking about, make sure I'm not wrong about certain things. Uh, like for example, I, I completely messed up in the previous video and I accidentally said a double when I meant decibel. And I talked mm. about what type you should use for currencies and say, because so, I was basically trying to say, don't use a floating point number. And there's different degrees of floating point. I don't get the whole thing. Anyway, <laughs> my point is, do your research. If you're going to do video content, uh, don't just assume, don't do it like, here's the way I do it. If you're going to actually like make yourself a, um, kind of, if you're going to put yourself out there as an educator on a topic, take the couple of days it takes to Google it and make sure that your, that your opinion on the matter lines up with what the general consensus is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you shouldn't be afraid to to express your opinion, but um, you know, at the same time, you just you want to make sure you're backing that up with you know good source material, knowledge, and research. So definitely, every video that I do, I research it heavily. I give it to Jason. Jason says, "What the heck is this?" And I have to go back and redo the whole damn thing. So you know, just take your time with it. Only about half the time. Yeah. Half the time, it's perfect. <laughs> I have that on uh, on recording now. <laughs> half the time, I'm perfect. It's good enough for me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically if you're going to make some video content, you know, I uh, just definitely wouldn't suggest, uh, half-assing it. Make sure you do your research. Uh, as far as workflow, you know, uh, I think that's something that if you're not someone who produces videos regularly for your day job, you're just going to have, that's going to have to be something you learn on the job. Um, I learn on the job. If you go back and look at some of my earliest videos, some of which are unlisted now, you will see a very horrible on-camera, camera presence and I still don't have the best on camera presence you know but I'm learning I'm still learning about lighting I'm learning about sound uh, how to set up your camera um, for me what worked was just going ahead going ahead and doing it and uh, taking criticism and learning from that so as far as workflow goes try to automate as much as you can learn as you go don't be afraid to change your process I still change my process to this day in fact I just learned a new thing about uh uh, how to do dynamic um, links be between After Effects and Premiere Pro. I'd always done that, but there's a really cool way that I, I'm doing it now, so it really streamlines my my workflow. But I've been doing this for three years, and I just discovered that, and it's like cut off 30 minutes for my whole editing process. So the point is, you're going to learn. Don't be afraid. Just go for it, and you'll you'll figure it out. Thank you, Coding with Unity, by the way, for the support. Really, really appreciate that, that uh, super chat. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for being here. <laughs> Be yeah. sure to smash that like button. <laughs> all right. We got in, in all seriousness, just as, as something kind of to play out of that mm. is um, it can often feel like you're a little bit alone in, in terms of doing game development stuff, right? Because you're mm. in the industry we're in, there tends to be a lot of a lot of people I would imagine here are either people who are studying programming in college, haven't mm. really done game stuff. They're doing it in more of a clinical way. 
or there are people who've gone out and have been working in software systems and enjoy games and want to get into games and kind of feel like they're on the edge in that side too. So it kind of it can kind of feel like you're on a sphere out at the edge of game development. It's very hard to break in. And in as well, in contrast, for, for people like myself, who's been doing this for X number of years, um, I still feel like I consider myself a classically trained, boring .NET developer. And most of my time is still .NET development. It's not as, I still use Unity, but not all the time. Um, and so it's good to have everybody here kind of talking about clean code and practices and, and building a better, uh, without being too cheesy, craft more so than just, you know, getting things done. And so I, I appreciate everybody's here actually enjoying this kind of content. It <laughs> means that there is a community that enjoys this sort of stuff. And that's, yeah. uh, it's, it's good to see you put it that way good it's def see. definitely good to see um it's funny that was actually one of the reasons i started this channel was i felt so sort of like on my own little rock and i was like i'm not really I, those of you on discord you know you probably know that i'm not really good at getting back or, or being involved in the chat i'm not good at forums i'm not good at uh, subreddits like i just struggle to be consistent with you know being a part of communities like that i love it i'm a, i'm like a lurker i guess that's what you call i'm a lurker um so i figured well if there's one way that i'm going to force myself up and out here is going to be putting videos out teaching what i'm learning um teaching what i know as a classically trained .net developer and applying that to software development and sort of that's how I grew this community as it is today, but uh, yeah, no, now that we're all here and we've got the discord server, I think it's, it, it, it's great. And by the way, that's a perfect opportunity for me to plug the discord server. Uh, there's a link in the description. Definitely join in on that. We've got tons of uh, channels that are all related to programming, clean code, unity. And in fact, if you go over there right now um, in the announcement channel, this morning I put up a poll uh, trying to figure out when the best time to live stream is. I've just been kind of working with my schedule, but I realize that there are a lot of folks out there in different time zones. So if you go on over to the announcement uh, channel in, in our Discord server, you'll see uh, a poll that you can vote on using some emojis. And basically it's just gonna say what day of the week works best for you and then what time slot. Uh, and that's and in a couple of weeks, whenever I get back from uh, my business trip next week, we'll go ahead and uh, implement that new schedule. So, yeah. Cool. I see some. Uh, I see another question. Actually, are we ever getting a profiler tutorial video? Or similarly, what's the best way to profile script performance? It's funny. I in my video for this Sunday, I actually do pull up the profiler, but it isn't really like an in depth uh, an in depth look at performance or profiling. I it's just to demonstrate garbage collection, which is also funny because someone also brought brought up the garbage collector uh, in this chat. But uh, I don't know. Um, that could be that could be definitely an interesting topic to cover. Uh, the profile. Yeah, it's, performance. it's well. This is actually something where shocker, I'm not super familiar with or comfortable with for the most part. It's not something <laughs> I actually do a lot of, and this this speaks to the whole thing about um, everyone just assumes experience. But a lot of my a lot of stuff I do is like I I can talk very comfortably about how to avoid memory issues in terms of um, writing code, but when it comes to the actual profiling stuff in Unity, a lot of the a lot of the issues I would hit usually come from uh, things like Overdraw, which is not an area that I tend to deal with because I tend to work with an artist that does most of the artwork, and I end up managing almost exclusively the code arena. So um, I certainly wouldn't be the guy for that. Like I'm not actually that particularly good at profiling Unity specifically. There's a lot of issues that can creep up that come down to everything from models to texture, memory to all sorts of stuff that I end up spending a lot of time Googling whenever I have to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe when, maybe when you Google something, Jason, you'll come across one of my future videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I cover, if I think if I do cover profiler stuff, see, I think uh, what sort of drives the videos that I create are obviously the community, but also sometimes it's, it's something that I want to learn more about. For instance, mm -hmm. Un Unity ECS, that series that put me on the map. Um, I only did that series because I was really interested in ECS and learning the pattern. And I, and I had, a, had actually already spent a, a good couple of months learning it and exploring it and following the, the, you know, looking in the forums and just trying to understand it. Got to a point where I was like, okay, I pretty much get this. It was in beta, so there wasn't really much to get. Um, and once I got comfortable, I made that series. So mm. I think as far as the profiler goes, I'm in the same boat as Jason. If I ever need it, I'll just Google it. 
but it is something that I'd like to add to my repertoire of knowledge. So, uh, so yeah, maybe I think if I ever do some videos on that, I'll probably just do it in steps. Like I'll cover a certain section of the profiler, you know, I'll come up with a funny skit where my alter ego is got some sort of issues with his code. It's funny in this, uh, actually this video that I'm going to come out with on Sunday, um, I had wanted to show, um, the effect of throwing an exception every frame and, and how that would slow down his game. Mm. And I couldn't get the game to slow down because my computer's so good. <laughs> that It's such a powerhouse that yeah, literally, uh, I couldn't get it to slow down. And then I tried to deploy it to one of the Android phones that I have lying around and I couldn't do it. So then I just had to talk to it. <laughs> but well, with the whole UI thread thing too, that's, that's the kind of issues. Cause when I was talking about that example, I was using X and A and X and A was like, if you want to do multiple threads, doing different stuff, you have to do it yourself. Hmm. Unity literally does manage the event cycle for you. And in, in terms of, um, exceptions and stuff like unity does gracefully capture exceptions, which in my opinion, it kind of shouldn't do, but it does. And um, that's kind of make, that can make it quite difficult to actually um, profile what that effect really is, you know? Yeah, I, I you can kind of see it in the video. I just I point out the little red spikes that are the garbage. And you see when I when I when I start throwing the exception, you'll see the spike go up. And, you know, and then when I get rid of that exception, you see it go down. And yeah, yeah, but, uh, but definitely sorry to get back to the question. Profiler videos. I'll look into it. I'll, I have a big list of topics in my notebook that uh, I'll, I'll add it to the list. Mm. And we do have a suggestion channel on the uh, Discord, by the way. A lot yeah. of good, just, just a lot of good suggestions come through on that. And you know, sometimes it may seem like I'm not listening, but I definitely refer to that very often. Uh, and by the way, because I kind of feel bad, I haven't called it out yet. Hmm. Patrick is being really helpful in the chat. Uh, he's talking about uh, this is the. The guy who's graced us with In Control, the asset I mentioned earlier, for people who don't know, mm. is a fantastic asset. That Because remember, Unity's um, input system is atrocious, at least the very <laughs> original one they had. Uh, personally, I don't like the new one either. But his, he brought out an asset, which is really good, which actually lets you manage uh, kind of a... Linguistically, you talk about actions versus um, managing buttons. So the problem is with a lot of input systems, you treat it as one-to-one -one bindings, where you start talking about things in terms of you know, an X button or a horizontal or a vertical. But if you if you build a, an asset that, that encapsulates your input, you can treat it as action, like the jump action. And then you mm -hmm. can uh, extract out the idea of what device performs the action versus listening to the action happening in your code and then. So his asset did a really good job of isolating those two. And, um, and I brought it up earlier as an example of somebody who had both a GitHub version and also an asset store version. And um, if memory serves, uh, like what a lot of people I imagine did is I tried out the GitHub version, quite liked it, but liked the benefit of being able to press a button in the Unity editor to just download it. <laughs> so paying whatever it was, five dollars is like a nice sort of what a novelty, developer man. is a great way of saying I get I get the ease of use to be able to just pull it up inside of the um inside of the editor when I add my assets. And well worth it. Um hmm. if I'm being honest, these days I use rewired a lot more. Uh, but that's only down to a lot of VR stuff I do. And there's like an automatic profiler thing that required is added. But I used in control for, I'd say, the first two years of my Unity development life. So cool. There you go. <laughs> just, hey. I just wanted to bring it up because he's doing a great job of answering questions in chat. Could be a, could be a, uh, an asset for my monthly productivity asset review. Could add it to the list. Although, is that really a productivity asset? I guess it kind of is. Well... Oh Actually, yeah, no, seriously. Yeah. Well, I guess it, it's more, it, it saves a lot of hassle in terms of you try to port between platforms. Mm -hmm. but I guess I suppose productivity, if you're counting like actual work productivity, maybe yeah. not. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Who, I don't even know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick, for hanging out in the chat and great asset. Uh, a couple of other small questions. Again, I keep jumping over them when I keep trying to, because we're having such a fun conversation. I don't like to derail the <laughs> bridge cycle back. Um, <laughs> one, one quick one from a while ago was, um, lighting settings is that a job for a programmer or a level designer oh i saw that yeah 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 and this is one that i think is an interesting question because it sort of speaks to a larger issue which is as i've said i firmly consider myself a software developer mm -hmm. i can use unity and i can talk about you know how the animation system works in unity and i can use i can make my own basic shaders and i can use the material system and i know how to um you know change the cube maps and do my lighting and uh, manage a lot of the unity stuff uh, but 
I try not to wherever humanly possible because I don't like it. Now, that's just the unfortunate truth is I just don't like a lot of the unity approach to certain things. But I made a point of learning how to do it. Mm. So the answer to the question of is lighting settings a job for a programmer or a level designer? Well, wherever humanly possible, I make the level designers. But I learned how to do it because it's something that you should know how to do because there's a lot of micro optimizations you can do when you understand how the lighting settings work. Yeah. Um, especially things like light probes. Like, for example, Bracky oh, yeah. said his video does a really good job of pointing out that a lot of people make the mistake when using light probes of evenly distributing them. Mm -hmm. Is their understanding is they are a probe you basically build a grid of them but that's not the case you actually want to place them in areas of light change that's yeah. the point of a light probe it represents a uh, someone taking a snapshot of what is the lighting at this region and so there's a lot of stuff you can learn by learning how the light work and how bounce lighting works like for example so many people drag around the directional lights the, the default light you get but position doesn't matter oh, yeah, it it's doesn't do rotation. <laughs> like it doesn't do anything and so there's things like that which are just sort of Learning how to do the lighting stuff will just make your life easier, both for custom projects and for working with people. So the question of, is it a job for a designer or programmer? It doesn't matter. You should know how to do it anyway. As, as a game <laughs> developer, yeah, you should. Yeah. 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 I, and it's, it's, it's one of those things because Unity really does expose you to everything. You know, if, even if you're just a single developer on a, on a team, you, you still have to open up you technically you still open up the unity editor you get you still get access to everything so yeah it's definitely good to know you know, it's funny about lighting too i think a lot of people really like messing around with shaders and messing around with like particle systems and like playing and being creative i love the lighting system like i i, I maybe it's because i'm such a control freak or something but i or i have ocd or like light ocd but i love messing with the the light probes and getting them just right and like like dragging an object in and out just to make sure that it works mm -hmm. i don't know it's i guess there's a there's a visual aspect to it it's really rewarding to finally bake the scene and like actually see the lighting changing correctly i will admit almost every single demo project even if i'm even if i open a brand new unity project with the sole intention of writing a script that changes some values for the sake of testing something, I will almost always add the post-processing stack <laughs> yeah, yeah. purely so I can just have, you know, a little, like, and also I'll always change it from gamma to linear for my, you know, like, and if they, I'll just like these little tweaks and I'll go, I just want it to look a certain way. I want it to look nice and slightly sort of uh, <laughs> cinematic because they, again, it's that sort of like sense of pride in your work. So, yeah. yeah. For sure. I mean, I've been doing a lot of boring. I shouldn't say that I've been doing. I've been using a lot of 2D projects uh, mm. for my examples lately. Um, and it's like it kind of makes me sad because I like playing with the lighting and I don't really get that opportunity. So I think I'm going to start doing a 3D 3D projects moving forward. My tutorial videos. My yeah. my my wife had a pretty good idea. She she said that I should commission someone to create a three D model of me that would be mm. rigged and work in Unity, uh, so that you know if I ever make a game example, it would literally be me you know running around inside of the uh, the example project. I thought that was pretty funny. Although I I usually just do a first person view because I'm too lazy to drag in a, <laughs> a model. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, now that's one thing I do cut corners on wherever humanly possible. I always. Um to use a first person just because i don't i just don't like this it's not that it's hard to, well it's hard to do it's not that's not a, it's more just a nuisance to manage matching your your animations to the speed of the walking to the timing it and getting your blend trees correct it's just like it feels so fiddly and i just hate doing it it's one of those things that i'm more than happy to pawn off on someone else and say oh, yeah. yeah you know i'll do, i'll program the character controller but let someone else do the <laughs> yeah for sure um, on kind of related to that, actually, is one of the one of the questions was how do you keep yourself on track for stuff that you don't like doing? So, for example, like all the stuff I just mentioned, whenever mm -hmm. it's code based, I feel fine. Whenever I'm dealing with, for example, physics, another one I hate. I hate using um, like I prefer whenever possible to write my own physics engine. Now, I know that sounds like, oh, my God, that's far more work, but it really isn't. You can just write a couple of simple algorithms and it's enough to build a very fundamental physics system. Now, obviously, you're missing a lot of stuff, but you're you're able to do a really good example of, you know, aggregate your user acceleration, aggregate to your velocity, and like make a comfortable little physics system that you can control very heavily. Um, comparing that to say physics system where you have to use physics materials and manage your friction and make sure the force strengths are correct, and you end up getting to these weird wacky scenarios that I just hate doing. I hate doing everything <laughs> physics. Related. So, whenever I have to do it. The way I force myself to stay on track 
is I give myself discrete goals. And we talked about this before. It's very agile based type stuff. Mm-hmm. It's because I hate every minute I spend doing it. I will write down I, the next job is I will make the, um, the hinge joint, the physics hinge joint for this, for the door work so that when I hit it with a cube, it will do this thing. It'll bounce, but not break on the hinge. Or and I will like write down a very explicit, this is what I'm spending my time doing. And I will then force myself to not, not change topics until I've hit that objective. And then I move on to the next thing. And it, obviously it helps the smaller the goals you make. Yeah. But if there's an area that you keep putting off, every programmer has that. Every developer on everything has that. There'll be a thing that they just decide. I hate UI, so I just always leave it to the last minute. Um, and if you want to force yourself to do it, take a small, discrete version of that goal. I will create some anchored things on the screen that show the health bar. And I'll display it to the phone and see how it looks and make sure it works. Yeah. You just give yourself a goal, do it. Don't let yourself change topics till you do it. That's unfortunately the best way I know <laughs> to keep myself on track. Doing those kinds of projects. you say unfortunate, but I don't know, man. I I I that's how I work. Every everything I do, from doing the dishes to you know folding laundry to working my day job to making YouTube videos, I do everything in incremental steps. And I keep a bullet journal. I don't know if I, I'm sure people have heard of bullet journaling, but I keep a bullet journaling that just encapsulates. All the little steps that I, I do. I even have a Kanban board that I, I use to to encapsulate every little step that I do. You know, like when I when I make a video, I'll have a step that is write the script, and then I'll have another one film the film film myself talking. Another one film the screen captures, and then it just yeah iterative steps, man. I don't know. It's a life. It was a life changer for me when I switched. Yeah, like you read a lot of books where people say like hack your brain and life <laughs> brain hacking tips. It's like it's annoying, but it's kind of a there's a nugget of truth in that, which is. People hate doing stuff. How do you convince yourself to do stuff? You have to give yourself a reward. So it's it's a cheat way where you basically keep feeding yourself the endorphins of, yes, I did a thing. Did Next step, Yes, I did a thing. And so there is a level of sort of manipulating your own brain chemistry by doing it. But yeah. The fancy way of saying the truth is people enjoy succeeding in things. So if you have a large task you hate doing, turn it into things you can achieve easily and then keep incrementing small steps of achievement. Uh, so yeah, it's it's just more of a like I'm annoyed that I have to do that, right? Like <laughs> you you can reason about logically that you hate doing it. You can yeah. fight yourself every step of the way, but no matter how much I can tell myself, I know it's just my brain it doesn't work unless I do actually reward myself with incremental progress of success. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of it requires more upfront work than others. Like it, for instance, yeah. talking about the UI, you really do have to reason through what is it that I'm going to do. You got to collect all the assets. You got to figure it out. For me, it's like I'm going to clean the house today. I the incremental steps are do the dishes. I know how to do it. It's muscle memory. Yeah. <laughs> Slow Put on the some music and just sort of go for it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Put on a good podcast. <laughs> good YouTube channel. Put on some infallible code. <laughs> just kidding. Yep. I don't. I don't watch myself. <laughs> uh, uh, a, let me see. You got anything? I see a funny question that I I don't know how to answer. Is Unreal better or worse than Unity? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I I think I'm going to take a stance on that. Oh, I, okay. Uh, I cannot take a stance on that. So you're on your own, buddy. I used to say no, and I used to say no for about six years. Hmm. I begrudgingly accepted. Unity is easier to work in, especially because I came from a .NET background. And I've even, by the way, I do have a little bit of chops in, in Unreal as well. I, I almost exclusively work in Unity now, but I used to use uh, Unreal back when it was UDK, or UDK was the developer version, hmm. while uh, UE3 was the version you'd pay for. And that was the, the, the one you'd use if your game was. You basically build it in UDK, and then you'd pay for a license, which would give you access to UE3, which would then let you commercially distribute your game. So I've done that stuff in the past. And I used to say it was better because its, it's rendering engine is just fundamentally better. At least it was for years. Mm. Um, as for whether you're... And also, just C++ is just more performance. It was better in every... But literally every year of every Unite, it's been harder and harder to tell something has that Unity look. For years and years, lots of <laughs> games had that sort of, oh, look, it's a relatively default skybox. The lighting yeah. fall off is fairly universally identical. Project. They all have a similar sort of sheen to them and everything looked <laughs> identical. But specifically the last two years, one after another, I, I'm looking at them going, I actually couldn't tell. There are, there are games like Tarkov, which is one people trot off a lot. And then there's like Pollen and a few others. You can just, you, you could make a screenshot 
set of them um, and just say which of these are made in Unity and you wouldn't be able to tell because they've managed to get the, the visual um, fidelity to match equally, if not better in, in certain cases. Mm. But on top of now being able to match visual fidelity, it still has the benefit it had way at the beginning. The thing which sold it before all of this stuff, which is the reason people picked Unity, is because of the interop and deployability. Hmm. Uh, it's just that if you build any project in Unreal, it will run worse on phones than Unity will. And that's not a fault of Unreal. It's just it's a bulkier engine. It's got a lot more visual fidelity and pack and punch behind it. Now, with the newer UE4 stuff, they've, they've made it more efficient than it used to be in the past. But it used to always be the case that it would have a harder time running on mobile. And now... Unity in general runs on everything. If you're building a game for Unity, the amount of turnaround time to port yourself from different platforms, and we live in a digital age, everyone wants to port in every platform now. <laughs> yeah. That it's very hard to beat that competitive advantage. So if someone said to me, I'm making a game, what platform would I build it in? Even if you still think Unreal looks better, the fact is the amount of potential revenue you can earn <clears throat> from distributing on so many platforms. Unity is just the de facto best game engine right now. It just is. Like it's, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't fight that anymore. It's like you can it, even it deploy to have the visual edge. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can build anything. You can literally, like, yeah, you can build it literally anything. So I don't know. So yeah, I'll officially say, as of maybe last year, probably is officially the moment I put my foot down and said I'm now 100 in the Unity camp. I think it's very hard to make a case anymore. Yeah. Aside from if you want to get really pedantic about C plus plus performance or something, but realistically, I think you're. You're, you're fighting a losing battle on that front too because once we bring in all the dot stuff, I mean, Unity's going to have the edge on mobile performance, on visual fidelity, on you know interoperability between different devices. The only thing that's missing is a good network stack. Once it gets yeah. a good network stack, Unity's and, going to and input. basically win. Although input, and input they, they do have assets for that, but yeah, you know, it'd be nice to have it built in. Um, there we go. There's my, I, I officially said it. I prefer Unity <laughs> almost entirely now. Unreal. What about uh have you ever used Godot? I don't know how to I never it. did actually, no. Godot. That's one I've literally never had an opportunity to use. Or well, reason to use it by that way. Yeah, the, the same here. I've never had a reason to use it. It looks cool and the developer seems really cool too. I've seen I've just happened to follow a lot of his videos and just things that I've seen on, on Reddit, but yeah, it's like uh, I just can't I see a reason. A ogre back in the day. Did oh, use ogre? I've heard of it, never used it. <laughs> I used uh, XNA I for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I used XNA, and before that, I used ActionScript three. And before that, I used original ActionScript two. Nice. Um, yeah, been through that whole pipeline. I even used Silverlight briefly when that was a thing. Oh my gosh! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I basically blinked. How old and is this guy? It was gone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, been doing it for a while. Yes, been through a lot of different technology stuff. <laughs> um let's see let's see if we can grab one or two more questions i know um it's only been an hour but i think I'm, we're gonna have to cut it a little short today um so let's see what kind of questions we can grab oh one thing that i think i've got a i'm, I'm in a good position to answer is one question here is what do you think about google cardboard now that google have dropped support for it do you hmm. think mobile vr has a future now this is a very long and complicated topic i don't want to get too far into but I have been in the VR scene for a very long time. Yeah, so you're, you're, you have a certain expertise with that, definitely. I, I was doing VR before I was officially doing Unity. Um, I was writing C Sharp scripts for people who were Unity developers who were doing VR stuff. Mm. And then I got a DK1 dev kit. I've had every dev kit since. And I've had basically somewhere behind me, there's a wall. In fact, probably in the corner of my screen there, you can see the quest. Uh, <laughs> there's. I have a whole, a whole rake of various VR headsets. And um, in fact, I used to do a VR podcast. I used to do a podcast with uh, two friends of mine. And we used to go uh, talk for hours about future VR. And I bring it up specifically because um, there is a friend of mine who goes by the, the, the name Reverend Kyle. And he, he famously was really on board and loved mobile VR. This was before the Gear VR came out. And I thought it was a horrible tragedy hated mobile VR. But the problem with mobile VR was that it, it basically does what the mobile market does, which is it causes the lowest common denominator. And like I discussed about Unity stuff, Unity can deploy on everything. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, why would you ever make your game for the Rift and you could make it for a mobile device and then scale it up if you need to, or just deploy it on multiple platforms? If you make a game that's targeted at a AAA system, it's a lot of work to downscale it. Uh, a good example of this being something like Superhot, which got moved from uh, Rift to Quest. And it was a, 
a lot of work and delays and people got really angry about it. It was well worth it. And the, the product is far better on Quest than it ever was on Rift. Um, but it's a, it's a work you don't want to do. Hmm. So all that being said, I was a major, uh, I majorly hated mobile VR for years. And like, there's, there's a famous podcast where myself and Kyle have a debate that lasts two hours about how much I'm saying, how it's going to, if anything is at risk of tanking VR as a thing. I understand <laughs> why it needed to exist, but whatever. And I kept that belief all the way through up until the Go came out. Now, the Go is defunct as well. That's another headset that doesn't really um, have, have a use anymore. Uh, but I tried that headset, and that was the first time I went, okay, I see it now. Because mm -hmm. now you're not using a mobile phone. And I know the question was about Google Cardboard, but I don't think that matters. The whole mobile phone as VR thing was a stopgap. We now have very viable mobile headsets. The best one being uh, the Quest is just fundamentally probably one of the best VR headsets you can buy even better than the AAA ones, especially wow. because that will actually connect to with the new uh, USB-C cable. Anyway, the whole, whole big rant. <laughs> My point is, it is not only not dead, it is probably the, as begrudgingly as somebody who hated it for years because I wanted my AAA high-end ultra experiences on PC. We're now back at the stage where it's come full circle. You can have a device like a Quest, which is both a pass-through for AAA titles when you're playing it on PC, or mobile on the go with games like Superhot, which is fantastically fun. Like <laughs> if you want a game you can put in your pocket and bring to a, some spring somewhere and just like show someone VR and get them psyched about it, it'll be the quest. Huh. So mobile VR is not only not dead, it is probably better than it's ever been and only going to get better. Interesting. You so you recommend you would you say the Oculus Quest is the best mm -hmm. one? Really? Even, even better than pass through? Yep, like I actually have, um, I have a Vive Pro in a box over there. Wow. I have an Index up there somewhere. I have Quest here. <laughs> uh, I've got a Rift S down there. Um, <laughs> and I would say if I was ever to recommend anybody a VR headset these days, that's the one. It's funny because okay. I'm in the market for a VR headset and I have the Index at the top of my list. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go big. You know what I mean? Get that's that it. One. That's the one. Right there. That's the one right there. Because <laughs> like my, you know, my computer's a powerhouse, so I'm like, let, might as well, you know, get something that I, that can utilize my machine. So the way you can do it is you can either go the Rift S route, where you pay <laughs> whatever it is, three hundred or so for right. a single unit, or you can get this, but you'll have to pay an additional price, which is a specific USB C cable, which will let you plug this into your PC as effectively a monitor, as a pass through, and oh. still have all the benefits. Oh, so you get the you, best of both worlds. You get the best of both worlds exactly. So there's no reason not to go for the Quest. <laughs> I'm so I'm, I'm buying it right now. <laughs> Expect a VR yeah, video. Link, link headset cable. You'll see it at the bottom of the page. It'll say link headset cable. Okay, you just buy that um, extra. You buy that extra thing. As All right, well. add to now, cart. Uh, funny enough, they're actually on back order and hard to get because oh, damn. it's so bought after. So you might have a hard time getting that so soon. But, but definitely, that's that's the way to go if you want to get into VR these days. You, should I get the 64 gig or that 128? In your as much as you can afford, get the get the biggest investor. All right, <laughs> done and done. Cool. Nice. Well, um, do you see any more questions? I, uh, if not, I think we should go ahead and wrap this up. The only, thing, yeah, I, the only yeah. thing I saw was what are my thoughts on the addressable system in Unity? And I would say, uh, just to answer that real quick, I like it. I haven't played with it too much, but what I have seen and played with, it still feels very complicated. Uh, it, it still feels kind of like the input system where, you know, conceptually I can see where they're going with it, but it's very hard to piece together and get working. Yeah, you, you have to manage like making sure you, you um, open it and access it kind of like a resource. It gets a bit confusing. Yeah, very um, confusing. I, thought... but I do think it will replace resources almost entirely. I think it'll be the completely new and best way yeah. to manage loading resources in Unity. They already recommend not to use resource.load. Yeah, that that is officially deprecated, or I don't think it's deprecated, but it's they they have said don't use this, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's pretty funny. Yeah, they, they're definitely on their way. Um, it's funny that Unity kind of in the past in the past couple of years it seems they're, they're doing that a lot. They're kind of saying, hey, don't use this anymore, but we're not quite ready to use anything else. So you're kind of in limbo. A good example of that is Unet. They say don't use mm -hmm. Unet anymore. We're working on multiplayer. It's kind of like quitting your job before you get a new one. A new job um, but anyway i think that's that's kind of how i feel about the uh, addressable system i think it's great if you can if you really need it for your project you know obviously you go ahead and use it but personally i'm just going to wait on that um especially with tutorials i'm not going to make a tutorial for that i made the mistake of doing a tutorial a couple of tutorials for the unity input system and a those are deprecated and b they were pretty bad to begin with <laughs> just because the content was so it would the content was very much like 
I'm just going to walk you through the steps to get this to work <laughs> as opposed to the input system in general is something that I, yeah, I, I try to avoid talking about at all because it's, it's changing too much. And I'm also not, I'm not happy with where they've settled yet. I'm sure it'll get somewhere better eventually, but it just, I'm not comfortable where it is at the moment. Yeah. Um, I guess as a, as a final closing out note, because a little bit of discussion mentioned about VR again as an end, I, I just want to say uh, regarding the question of is, even if you step away from mobile VR and go, is VR dead or is VR, where, where does it sit currently as a, as a entertainment medium? I'm going to reuse a snippet of some other video I, I did earlier this week for some other purpose, which is hmm. um, if you for, forget about VR as a thing, forget about monitors or phones, or everything else. Think about the fact that everything you do, whether it's a phone or a game or anything else, we're talking about data. Data is this infinite conceptual stream of stuff that's out there in the world. And everything we do digitally is trying to access data, using apps to change data online, using your phone to, to visually represent it. Um, and it's all about trying to get data to you in a way that doesn't impact your life too negatively. Um, phones are the best way we've figured out how to do this on a regular basis. The point of VR is to dive into that sort of conceptual collection of data, to kind of completely turn off the real world and go into uh, another one. So the question of is VR a fad or is it only last a while? I don't think it ever will be just a fad or it'll ever go away because it's now established itself as it does a job, a job nothing else does, which is I want to live in data for a while and do something with it. Hmm. We haven't found a good way of using that yet, but it is literally unlike anything else. No, nothing else does that at the moment. No amount of screens around your face is going to completely immerse you in data in the same way. Um, and going further from that, you've got AR, which is going to eventually uh, add the diegetic connection of data to your real life in a way that doesn't require you to disconnect from what you're doing, pick up your phone, focus attention, then go back to what you're doing. So VR and AR are not some sort of, you know, they're not like a new form of monitor or they're not like 3D or some other sort of thing yeah. like that. They Realistically, they form, they serve purposes that we just don't really have a lot of use for yet. But mechanically and technically, they do stuff nothing else does. So there will be com there'll be industries where they'll use VR to train pilots in a case which nothing else makes sense to do that with. Or they will use AR to do presentations and represent 3D models and represent scale in a way nothing else can realistically do that for. Is the whole classic thing we talked about before: use the right tools for the right job. Well, VR and AR are just tools, and they will have jobs. It's just Compare it to computers. We've had computers now for 67, whatever, X number of years. I don't even know how many years we've had computers for, but enough time that we've learned how to find good use cases for them. VR as a viable product has only been around now five, five years, maybe. And again, it's been around a long time. Like you can go back and find way earlier. But I'm saying something is a product you can have on your desk that has a use five years. So mm -hmm. give it a bit more time before we uh, to find why it's useful yeah. before we kind of give up on it as a concept. Last question. Would you spend three days in a VR headset <laughs> or however long it was a week? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, fair no, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> well, that's it for today's stream, or I should call, I should say unity 3d game developer discussion. So, still, still workshopping. The name. Oh, and another thing we should probably put up a little guide, just like the opposite of what Charles does on his videos where it says play at 1.5 speed. If you're having trouble understanding my rapid fire Irish uh, <laughs> accent, feel free to drop the speed down two or three steps because uh, I unfortunately am not very good at speaking slowly. Just so, speed uh, it up when I talk because I, I sound really weird when I talk so look. There's, a, there's literally a plugin in Chrome I use called Video Speed Controller. And, oh, that's cool. Uh, I can use the, uh, the A and the D keys on my keyboard to hmm. nod up and down two or three steps and it's nice. watch things at point eight or four. 1.2 or whatever. Yeah. I wonder if I could um I can get that and wire it up some way to my uh, stream deck. That'd be kind of nice. <laughs> that might be cool. That'd yeah. be kind of cool. I actually have a, I have a shortcut right. I set it to 2.5 speed. Whenever I press the R key when I'm in Chrome, mm -hmm. it'll just speed up a video to 2.5 speed. I can nice. watch like when I'm watching tutorials and I can then just tap it to kind of go back and forth between. That's pretty very good. Very fast at normal speed. Play around with that. All right. Well, next week, uh, again, I will not be here uh, on camera. I will try my best to be uh, present in the chat. Uh, Jason will be streaming on my behalf. So he's got a live video tutorial of sorts to share with you. Uh, he's already kind of showed, walked me through it, and it's very cool. So um, after that, the following week, I'll be back in the studio, so to speak. So we will 
try to continue looking at Sean's code, uh, that Oregon Trail port that he created. And uh, Jason and I already started working on it, and uh, we're trying to formulate it in a way that's most valuable to you guys because who yeah. wants to watch two guys fumble around, two programmers fumbling around in a code base? trying to workshop what uh, how to refactor code. It's not, it's not very valuable to you guys. So other than that, be sure to like this video. Um, see that where we've got 17 like despair, uh, um, ratio uh, or missing likes. So make sure you hit those likes. Um, and also check out the highlights from last week's stream. They're, they're as always, they're very valuable. And uh, hit, hit like on those too. Also, I got a video. And if, and if you haven't joined the Discord yet, yes. we're, we hang out there. So feel free to ask questions over there. Yes, unfortunately, I have a, a meeting for work in about 20 minutes, so I won't be able to jump on the Discord. But Jason will be there, and so will everybody else. So go hang out with them. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, <laughs> that's about it. Thank you for coming, and see you later. Yeah. <laughs>